Good evening. I hope CTF thing is going well. Uh, for the people that are here, I'm going to talk today about uh, the differences and what things you can do basically with some basic and simple quantum circuits. Uh, who am I? Uh, well, I am an average quantum computer enjoyer and I'm currently studying physics and computer science. Well, what more do you have to say? Uh, what is the motivation behind this talk or why should you listen? Well, uh, there are many big companies like IBM, Google and Amazon and D-Wave that are currently researching quantum computers and they pay a lot if you understand them and you can, be, can implement some algorithms with them. What can they be used for? You can crack some, could theoretically crack some encryptions. You can accelerate a lot of workloads that need some optimization, like uh, folding uh, uh, proteins and developing pharmaceutical medicine. And well, does it work yet? Sadly, uh, it does not. We have currently uh, the largest quantum computer there exists has four, about 400 qubits, but all of these are physical, but they need to be error corrected that reduces the number of working qubits to a um, set that is I unusable for any real application at the time. But they're still useful for learning and working with simple kind of circuits to get a good feel what you can do in the future with them. Well, I'm trying to give you a tool this, in this talk so that you are able to understand the basics of how a quantum computer or quantum gates work so that you can may apply them in the future if somebody would like to go in that direction and then you don't have to start from zero. Well, and also there are some CTF challenges that use it, like the DICE CTF that I've linked here, that give you imaginary internet points. That's what you here are here for, yes? Uh, so how does a qubit and a bit uh, differ from each other? Well, uh, there's often the saying, a qubit can be something in between a one and a zero. That's something you might have heard. But what this actually means is that there is a possibility for it being zero and there's a possibility for be it being a one. Basically, you're allowed to have a probability distribution between two states. In the classical sense, as you can see here in the table, the one is 100% probability at the one state and the zero is 100% probability at the zero state. And if you are able to move the probabilities between the two states, you have a qubit. Well, uh, here is a little mathematical representation. You can uh, move the probabilities. Maybe the earlier slide is better. As you can see, the coefficients of the two states squared are the probabilities of receiving such a state like a zero or one. And with that, uh, and shifting these uh, coefficients is the important part of the whole quantum circuit design. How you shift those affects the probabilities and if you move the probabilities to your advantage, you can calculate stuff you weren't able to calculate before. And as we can see here again, both of these coefficients are some number that is able to be represented in a 2D, 2D plane with a circle. And the important uh, part about this is the squared uh, amplitudes of these numbers summed up need to be one because probability of being in any state has to be conserved. So let's start with doing a simple circuit. Uh, I have chosen the NOT circuit. That is something that everybody probably has seen. If you have a zero, it gets turned to a one. If you have a one, you, it gets turned to a zero. Well, how should this work in a quantum sense? 
basically in a similar fashion. Uh, you have some probability on a zero, and you have some probability on a one. And just swap them. That's a knot. Now we can go a little bit more difficult with an AND gate. Uh, we know it takes two inputs and has one output in the classical sense. But here we have two outputs. The case uh, for this is it needs to be reversible. A quantum circuit always needs to be reversible. If you have, if you have to know what, from the output, you have to know what went in to get back to what went out. It has to be able to go in both directions. Basically, if you re-input the same input, it has to do the inverse of what you did earlier, more or less. And as we can uh, see here, if you have an output as a zero, for example, in the AND gate, you wouldn't know if it would be zero, 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 one, or one, zero. It could be any of the three. That's why we need the extra output right here. And as you can see, we will input uh, one third and uh, two thirds of probability on both of the bits we're putting in, and you get out on the upper right uh, a probability for zero of five ninths. Uh, you would probably ask why five ninths? Yes, if you look at the truth table, every if you multiply every probability with each other. Uh, for example, zero times zero is one ninth, and zero times one is two ninths, and you sum them up, you get five ninths for all the cases that end in zero. And that's how you basically know how an end gate should work. Well, we did it. Uh, we were able to do anything a classical computer can do on a quantum computer, just way slower, way worse, with much more error correction. Is this all? Well, thankfully not, otherwise we wouldn't be doing this. Uh, we have now done the AND and NOT gate. Now we are going to look at the Hardamar gate and the C NOT gate. These two are basically taking advantage that you are able to move and shift the amplitudes and the probabilities between the two states you have. This, in turn, allows you to do more stuff and calculate something more efficiently if you know the problem and can prepare the problem as you would like it. Let's start with the Hardamar gate. I know it's quite a lot on the slide, but the important part is uh, they both uh, give you the same probability distribution after applying it, but the result isn't the same. The thing I want to highlight is that the upper one has a negative amplitude in front of the one, and the lower one has a positive amplitude. This is going to be really important for the algorithm we're going to talk through later. So more or less what it does, it kind of shifts the probabilities on equal parts if you put in a, si a single state, it basically rotates it 90 degrees and distributes it across two uh, orthogonal states. Well, uh, could you repeat that? I didn't. If it's not one. Yes, uh, uh, I, well, it's quite fun. Uh, if it's not one, it's a probability distribution across the two. And if you would, uh, you could re represent it as a so-called superposition. Posi that's the thing we, oh, wait, that's wrong direction. Uh, we had basically on that slide, A times zero plus B times one. And if you would apply it, the Hadamard gate, I put the mathematical definition just there. Uh, this, the probability of the zero part goes to the zero, and the probability of the one part goes to the one. And then you can calculate the new coefficients and add uh, them together as you would like them to be. Uh, 
And that's how you would know uh, the, how the Hardemar gate would act differently. If you would plot this, it would look something like a weird eight. If you would go through all the possible probabilities. But these two cases are uh, the most used because you can always define a state to be zero because why the hell not? You can choose whatever. And you always uh, can then also define a one. And if you want to have a state that's orthogonal or rotated to some uh, part, uh, orthogonal to this basis, basically uh, it's the complement basis of these two, more or less what you can do with the Hardimer gate. That's it, what it's used most of the time. So did that answer your question? Yes. So now let's talk about the CNOT gate. Uh, the CNOT gate is a really important gate for uh, producing some entangled states. This can be really useful for more complex algorithms, but we won't use it today anymore. But in a short form, what it does, it basically just, as you can see, flips uh, the two probabilities of uh, two and three, and that's basically it. it before we were able to separate uh, the probabilities, and now we are not anymore able to do that after this operation. As you can see here, we have some state one, a times zero plus b times one, and c times zero plus d times one. If we combine them, we just multiply the coefficients and we get the probabilities of observing uh, each du uh, duplicate uh, state. And after applying the CNOT, we just again swap the two coefficients, but then we might not be able to separate them again, and that's what basically entanglement does. Uh, now, let's go through a important uh, algorithm that uh, demonstrates uh, supremacy of quantum computers over classical ones, but it's just a little advantage. Uh, we are going to look at the problem if a function is, a decision problem, if a function is constant or balanced, and it only has the outputs zero and one. I took the liberty to uh, show what I mean with some truth tables, or basically some transition tables. Uh, the constant ones are the ones that always output the same bit. The balanced ones are the ones that output different bits. And if we would want to decide if this, a function that we're given, if we don't know the function, if it is constant or balanced, we would need two inputs. We would first need to input zero and then one and see what comes out. And now we're going to look at it how we would go about doing this on a quantum computer. Well, we're going to use the same thing we did earlier. We're going to use a NOT gate to turn a zero to a one for the low input. And we are going to use a Hardimer gate to basically rotate them a little and balance them out. Important part is that the coefficients between the one and the zero have negative amplitude with respect to each other. It's not really good visualizable. I tried my best like with the other slides with the probability distributions. But what basically happens after this mapping, if you can believe me, if you don't believe me, I have more slides if you're interested, uh, it maps the output state to, again, to one of those two states right here. It either outputs it to a zero with a minus and a zero uh, with a plus uh, one right there. Those states are often called plus and minus because it's the only way to differ from each other. And after the application of this gate, and a harder mark again because of the, that the 
gates are inverses of themselves, more or less, you would receive either a zero or a one as an output. And if you would get a one, you would know it's balanced. And if you get a zero, you would know it's constant. And then you would only need one execution to figure this out. Well, that was my talk. <laughs> if you're interested in uh, how this works, because I hid a little fact, uh, I have some more f uh, uh, foils if you would be interested, or it's also fine if you don't want. Uh, currently not. They're planning to make a uh, a course on the physics department, as far as I know. There is a course from a Professor Sexty, I uh, uh, Yes. Yeah, so there is a course, but I haven't taken it yet. As I said, I'm an average quantum computer enjoyer. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, I hope it gave you a glimpse on what quantum computers can do and what's the important part about quantum computers. Thank you for listening. <laughs>